Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in to Winning Cures Everything. It is your Tuesday night solo show. I am your host, Christopher Giannini. And uh, I am excited about some things that are going on. Last show that I did was kind of a downer. We're going to try to pick it up. Okay? Lots of things going on. Um, we're going to break down the uh, the championship game. But first, I want to tell you, go to winningcureseverything.com. Gary's worked his ass off on getting that uh, website looking really good and 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 trying to, to, to clean everything up and making it look sharp. You can find everything you need to know about us there. Uh, if we ever write anything, we put it up there. If we, it, you know, all of our picks, everything we do, all of our videos, if you want to search something out, you can find it there. Uh, go there. And then also, sbrpicks.com slash NCAA, or you can go to sportsbookreview.com. Uh, they are the ones that pay the bills. We are appreciative of being a partner with them. You can find all all of your gambling need. They got baseball. They got NBA stuff. They got hockey stuff going on right now. Um, you can get your fill. Go see them. They take care of us. We're going to take care of them. And uh, and let's get on with it. First thing we're going to do today, reactions to last night's championship game. I want to say it was a dud, but it wasn't to me. While it was a blowout, the fact that it was the underdog doing the blowout changed it for me a lot. Both of these teams, neither one of them have ever won a championship. Baylor gets the, the school's first national championship in basketball. I think that's a huge deal. I think that's a big deal. The world now knows who Drew Scott is. Uh, sorry, Scott Drew is. I'm, I'm never going to be good if you've got two first names. I don't, I don't trust people with two first names. Gary and I have been through this before. Um, I I thought it was really exciting. My takeaways from it were Baylor was just that dominant. And there's a very interesting situation of Baylor not going through. See, I don't I don't want to take any credit away from what they did. All right. I, I know that there was a part of me that was worried about Gonzaga being worn down after that UCLA game. There probably was some of that to it. I just think Baylor was an overall better team from top to bottom. We're going to go through it. I've got some notes that 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 I thought about uh, about the game, but um, I I just thought Baylor was the best team, and I don't think it was close. They lost one game to Kansas, coming off a three week COVID break that Gonzaga didn't have to deal with. I think that's you know forgivable in the grand scheme of things. And then, and then they lost to to Oklahoma State in the uh, in the in the the uh, Big Twelve tournament. Okay, they lost to the best player in the game. That's going to go number one overall in the draft. All right, that's that happens. And then and then they lost to to Kansas, who's a very good team when they were coming off of not being able to play basketball for three weeks, not being able to work out or practice for three weeks. Um, all those things kind of explain their two losses. And after that. Man, they got into this tournament, and they beat the hell out of everyone they played. And I think they played the hardest run to the to the finals that anybody else had. Maybe not Gen other than Gonzaga. I do think Gonzaga playing uh, UCLA and USC back to back was was pretty grueling. Those are two really good defensive teams that that just wear on you. Um, overall. I think depth beat star power, okay? Not that Baylor doesn't have stars, but I think the combination of Butler and Mitchell was far better than Suggs. I think the combination of uh, Mark uh, Vital and uh, Flo Thambu, I'm, I'm sure I butchered those names, but maybe not, absolutely outplayed Timmy. I, I, just, I just think they were a much deeper team. I was in my group chat with some friends. I was I was DMing with folks on uh, on Twitter last night during the game, and when Baylor got into foul trouble, everyone started panicking. Now the dude, they're up by sixteen. They're up by sixteen, and they were like, "Oh, but they quit playing defense because they're in foul trouble." They don't have to play defense. They just have to keep scoring. If they score every other time down the court, and Gonzaga scores every time down the court, 
there's still not enough time left in the basketball game for Gonzaga to really catch up. And that's just not going to happen because Baylor never stopped scoring. Baylor's bench came in and they were putting up points. They were making plays. They were making defensive plays. They were just the deeper team. They were overall the better team. And, and I just thought it was one of the most impressive and dominating runs I've ever seen in the NCAA tournament. If you look at what they did collectively as a whole throughout the whole tournament and then what they did to the best team in the sport all year long, what they did to them last night. Unbelievable performance. Absolutely incredible. One takeaway that I thought after the Final Four game. Final Four buzzer beater by Suggs was, A, that's one of the best games I've ever watched, okay? The buzzer beater was a great buzzer beater. It's up there in the pantheon of buzzer beaters, but the one thing that it didn't have going for it that the Leitner uh, buzzer beater had that a couple others that were great throughout the history had is it didn't win the championship. It just got you to the next round. And what that reminded me of, and, and I'm not taking shots at Suggs. I think he's an unbelievable player. I think he's going to be a great NBA player. His game is going to evolve. This guy is a two-way dude, and, and he can play the game. But the Final Four buzzer beater finish, him jumping on the table, pounding his chest, celebrating, great, wonderful. I think these kids should celebrate when they win. It reminded me a whole lot of John Wall. Game six, 2017, against my Celtics. He jumped up on the scorer's table after hitting a big buzzer winner to win that game, and he had a hell of a game, just like Suggs. And he pounded his chest, and he celebrated, and the team carried him off, and it was unbelievable. And then game seven came, and he came up very little, struggled to get shots off, made very little shots when he got them off, couldn't get to the basket, couldn't get open, didn't really have a big game on defense, just floundered away. Those semifinal games, th those game six moments, those, those final four moments are not what carries legacy. It's what happens in the championship game that lives forever, that you watch forever. John Wall's game six will only be remembered in Washington. And for most people, it will be remembered a little bit tongue-in-cheek as a joke because of how small they came up in Game 7. And I wonder, is that going to happen to Suggs? Is that going to happen to, to Suggs' Game 4, uh, Final 4 um, game? Because it was an incredible performance. And no one's taking that away from him. But when you don't cut down the nets after the championship, and you personally really got taken out of your game. Baylor did an unbelievable job of saying, Suggs and Timmy ain't beating us. They got two guys that are stars, and we are, are we're just not going to let those guys beat us. Somebody else is going to beat us. And, and, and Gonzaga's got other guys. They got other dudes that are really good. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. This is what you do when you got two stars on the team. You take those guys away, and you say somebody else is going to have to have a performance of their life. And they didn't do that. And, and I just think kudos to Baylor for the game plan. I felt like every time out they came out of, uh, Scott Drew had the perfect play call. It was basically every time they came out of a, a, a timeout, I just, I just go, went ahead and, and our group chat, I just chalked it up two points. Sometimes it was three. But it was just one of those situations where they're not missing. And this guy's drawing up plays, and Gonzaga has no clue what to do. I, I found it very interesting that Gonzaga, who's been a really good defensive team throughout this tournament, um, they have they went to a 1-2-2 a two, two zone at one point in time. Then they went to the 3-2 zone at one point in time. They don't play zone ever. I felt that they were getting desperate and they were grasping for straws, and I'm okay with that. But at some point in time, I think the game was over by the time they did it. I remember Jim Nance. God, I have no idea what the time was in the game. I'm sure it was it, it, seven, eight minutes left in the game. Probably quite a bit of time left in the game. Um, Jim Nance screams out, we're down to single digits as Gonzaga takes it to nine. And I just laughed and I thought, this is, man, he is working hard to keep the audience interested because two quick possessions, 
Baylor scores, brings it back to 11, goes down, gets a defensive stop, scores again, <laughs> makes it 13, defensive stop, goes down, scores again, hit, hits a three this time, makes it 16. Bam. Like, ever since he shouted, and it's down to single digits, it was never close to single digits again. It never got less than, I think, 15 points after that. And and it just stayed a, a beaten of which I haven't seen in a long time. Listen, I wasn't around. <laughs> I wasn't around for the UNLV, um, you know, 103 to 73 uh, beat down against Duke. Okay. I didn't, I didn't see that. All right. I wouldn't lie for it. I've seen highlights of it. But, but some of the major just butt kickings that have happened in the finals and the championship games, I, that was before my time. I, I haven't seen anything like this. I haven't seen a team get dominated this way in a championship game, much less the team that everyone thought was the best team in the country, and we didn't think it was close. So – do I think this is an indictment on Gonzaga and their schedule and they play out there in that West? No, no, I don't think any of that. I think Gonzaga is going to continue to be a great program. I think Gonzaga is going to continue to grow. This is, this is what you do. This is why it matters getting to the tournament over and over again is because the more shots you have, the more you learn. I, I think they have an unbelievable program. What I love most about what happened with both of these teams playing one another, you had two coaches that went to two smaller schools or two non-big boy schools, definitely Baylor, not a basketball school, and they didn't look at them like stepping stone jobs. They've been there for a long, long time, and they grew those programs to what they are. And and I think that's amazing. I think eventually Gonzaga's probably going to get to promised land. I think they're going to eventually cut down the nets because I think they've got the right program in place. And and they're they're just going to eventually be able to do it. They're going to pull it off. I, I, I trust that organization. I trust that school. I trust the men and women that run that basketball program to do it. I, they look like they're capable and competent, and they're some of the best in the country at doing it. And, you know, we'll, we'll just have to see, you know, how it goes going forward. But last night just wasn't their night. And, and this year, man, I, I, I think we all overlooked Baylor for a long time. And congratulations to them. Uh, Scott Drew is not a likable coach in the realm of other coaches. But if you look at the coaches that hate him, if you look at the coaches that always are, are very questionable about him, you look at – you know, Bill Self and Rick Patino, and these are guys that are kind of, not just kind of, they're, they're proven to be very seedy guys, and it's okay. All right, you rub those guys the wrong way, yeah, maybe you're doing something right, you know. And uh, so I, I, I kudos to, to Scott Drew, kudos to the Baylor Bears. I hope Baylor pays him. I hope he stays in Baylor. Make it a basketball school, man. Grow that program and uh, and continue to, to win. I love the fact that the state of Texas is as big as it is. It's got as many damn schools as they've got. And they've all got so much money. And they put so many resources into football and basketball. And now there are two schools in the state of Texas in the history of the NCAA basketball tournament that have had wins, that championship wins. And it's Baylor and it's West Texas. And I just – I love that the big boys have got to be just kicking themselves in the ass trying to figure out how in the world have we been playing basketball for almost 100 years and we can't win, but these small schools are able to do it. I don't know. I, I, I just find that in, I, I find it entertaining and, and interesting and whatever. So let's move on. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Sam Darnold trade a little bit. Gary and I broke that news yesterday on our, our show as we – I mean, I, we didn't break it. It came through literally as we were preparing to start our Monday evening live show. And uh, and I've had a day to digest it. I've had a day to think about it. I've, uh, I've listened to some other people give opinions, which is usually something I don't like to do because I want my opinions to be genuine. I want them to be real. But I, you know, I, I, I kind of couldn't help today but to, but to listen to some other guys and – 
they brought up some interesting points, and, and I'm going to share those with you. First things first, um, the Ringer NFL show talked about Sam Darnold, how bad Sam Darnold really has been in, throughout history of, of, of his plane, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this. I'm going to read this to you. I got this from the Ringer NFL show from – it came out this morning. I don't know if they did the pod last night when it dropped or whatever, but it's the most recent one if you check it out. 42 quarterbacks have thrown 500 passes or more over the past few years. 42 of them. Sam Darnold ranks 41 in passer rating and 40 run in a 41 in adjusted yards per attempt. He is almost DFL at the – Two stats that we use to really judge and grade quarterbacks on. Now, I understand that we have to grade this thing on a curve because of the Adam Gase factor. But even if you give him a couple of points or, hell, a bunch of points for the Adam Gase factor, you got to go a long-ass way just to get to the middle of the pack. That's a little worrisome. The 42nd person, if you're interested to know who that is, is Josh Rosen. I I don't I don't know I I don't know how to how to take that and think that this is gonna work out. I originally my initial thoughts was that Sam Darnold's not that bad. He's just been stuck in the Jets program for too long and, and he and he can't succeed there. That's just a, a losing battle, no questions asked. Man, I don't know. I, I do think there is a world. I brought this up yesterday to Gary. There is a world in which he's just that bad. He's just not good. Now, that brings in the next question. Winners of this trade, I think I think Sam is the biggest winner. He's a big winner. Let's call him that. He's a big winner of this trade. Getting out of New York, getting out of the Jets, going to a much smaller city, a place that's going to embrace him. And, and let him have every opportunity to succeed. Going to an organization that's ran by, you know, offensively two men that I trust more than almost any organization, Matt Rule, Joe Brady. I think he's a big winner there. The biggest potential winner, now I use the word potential because if this is a huge embarrassing failure, it's not a win. But the biggest potential winner of them all is Mr. Joe Brady. Joe Brady last year got head coaching interview jobs for, for I think he interviewed for three different head coaching jobs. He's already one of the hottest names in coaching right now. This man had his first full-time job ever as the assistant OC and passing game coordinator for the 2019 LSU Tigers, the greatest college football team ever to play. Okay. He was the assistant OC, and I know that everybody gives him all the credit for that offense. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, he would tell you, and it's not humble bragging, that he was not Steve Emzinger. That was Steve's offense. He called third downs. That's all he called, third downs. And and he, he put together the passing game uh, plan throughout the week. LSU didn't have a lot of third down opportunities because they were so efficient in the offense that they ran. That's his experience. First full-time job ever. Second full-time job ever, one year later, the OC of the Panthers. I, pretty amazing. If he somehow saves Sam Darnold's career, if he makes Sam Darnold look like one of the top 15 quarterbacks, I'm talking middle of the pack, 16 quarterbacks and above, if he finishes 16th, there are going to be teams that are going to fire decent coaches to try to get Co uh, Joe Brady to, to be their head coach. With three years of, not head coaching experience, with three years of coaching experience, period. I think that's unbelievable. I, 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 I hear that and I think, holy shit, man. Only in America. Like, this is the greatest country in the world, right? I, a guy so young can be super successful, mildly successful, save this guy that looks broken and change his stars, change his status in life. I, 
Joe Brady's got the biggest lottery ticket of them all if he can make Sam Darnold successful. The question is this, is Joe magic? Because if Mr. Brady's not magic, I don't I don't know how you're going to help Sam. I, I rolled off the numbers. I do think he's better than he was with the Jets, what we saw with the Jets. But I don't know that he's a lot better, which means I, I don't know it's going to work out. I, I think it's very wise that they haven't gotten rid of Teddy Bridgewater. If I was Teddy, I would take this as an opportunity to um, challenge and compete because I think this is absolutely still going to be Teddy's job. Um, there's a chance. There's a world in which this is Teddy's job. And if it's not, and Sam comes out, and Sam looks like game busters, and he can, I don't know, lead them to the playoffs and, and, and make that offense look really good. What in the hell do we think about Joe Brady and his ability to to morph and and teach quarterbacks, and and then what's in store for him after that? You know, I mean, I, I just think I I don't know. I think that's one of the most amazing things. It, it baffles me, and uh, to think that that he could get a head coaching job so quickly with such a short resume. I don't know that it's not deserved. I don't know that it's not earned. But at the same time, you know, it's a it's a little, you know, shocking to say the least. Um, but I guess his results have been shocking, you know. I mean, he, he took the LSU Tigers offense and he was a part of a team that, that changed the game for that entire school, that entire state, and, and made them look – like something we've never seen before in college football. And then if he can rehabilitate the image of Sam Darnold, the ghost of Sam Darnold, I don't know. I mean, hell, maybe he can. Maybe he's a little Kyle Shanahan-esque to where it doesn't matter who his quarterback is. I'm going to uh, put up points, and I'm going to make him look good, and I'm going to put him in situations to succeed, and I'm, I know what he can do, and those are the things we're going to call. And I'm going to build an offense around those. I, maybe he's got that. I, it's going to be interesting to see. It's going to be interesting to see where he ends up and where he lands and what the trajectory of his career looks like. And uh, and I'm, I'm pretty excited for it, being a guy that's a pretty big Joe Brady fan. Last topic of the day. Then we'll get out of here. I brought up Kyle Shanahan. I I have an opinion. I, I think I've said this in passing quickly, very quickly throughout our show. I know that I have thrown this out to several of my friends through text or whatever, DMs, if you've talked to me about my opinions on the NFL draft. I I think there is a world in which we're going, we're, we're all getting fooled by the 49ers at three. I, I think I, this is a long shot. And you know that I like dogs. You know that I like betting on long shots. I don't like conventional wisdom. I always want to challenge conventional lines of thinking. I think Kyle and Bill are really close. Okay, I think Kyle Shanahan and Bill Belichick are very close. I think they build their teams extremely similar. Okay, I think there is a world in which Kyle... And, I, and I, I think I'm kind of believing this. And I think he's going to shock the world on draft night. I think Kyle Shanahan is going to draft Kyle Pitts with the third pick overall. I think that's why he moved up. I think he wants two monster tight ends. And instead of getting two veteran guys like Bill's got, both those guys kind of injury prone, he knows his guy's a little injury prone. Now he's going he's gonna to run it with two young guys that are – Stupid, crazy athletic. And when I say crazy athletic, they they are the two most athletic tight ends and two of the most athletic people in all of the NFL when Kyle Pitts gets there uh, uh, to, to, to pair up against uh, Kittle. I think that's what he's going to do. I think he's going to go into the season with Jimmy G. Jimmy G was one overthrow away from winning him a Super Bowl. I think he knows that. And then I was looking at other quarterbacks late that you could get Late in the draft. I found this shocking, by the way. I found this shocking. CBS has a pretty good NFL sports team. And they break down the draft pretty well. And they break down prospects. They don't break them down as to how they grade them. Okay? They break them down after talking to teams and give up a value on them. 
there are there are two names that I think are grossly undervalued. Some of that is because the top names are so overvalued, it's pushing the other guys back. Ian Book, I've I've been I've been openly honest. I think Ian Book has a chance to be a really good NFL player. Ian Book is projected to be undrafted. That that blows my mind. That is something I can't understand or explain. I've watched this guy play football. I've watched every snap of his. I cannot believe this guy couldn't find a job on Sundays. There's not an organization out there that's bad at quarterback that wouldn't bring this guy into the room to see if he could make somebody compete for a job, that he could just try to to make somebody outwork somebody to steal a job. That's insane to me. That's just insane. Undrafted. And then the other guy, Kellen Mond, project, learned under Jimbo Fisher, great, great quarterback mind. And uh, Jimbo didn't draft him, did, uh, recruit him, but Jimbo inherited him, and Jimbo evolved him, and his game under Jimbo got better, which tells me he's capable of learning new things. He's cap- you put him in an offensive-friendly mindset with a team with a quarterback guru like a Kyle Shanahan, and he can learn anything. And if I was Kyle Shanahan, and I was going to go up and I was going to take the monster that is Kyle Pitts, I would spend two late round draft picks. Right now, Kellamon is projected to go mid to late fifth round. That is almost undrafted. Okay. I would I would take my chances with Kyle Pitts and Ian Book, and I would bring them into the locker room with Jimmy Garoppolo. Let Jimmy play out this year. And let's see in practice who those other two guys are and what they're made of. And if they've got anything that the NFL can bring. Because Kyle has shown before he can do it with almost anybody. Nobody knew who Kirk Cousins was until Kyle Shanahan got a hold of him. Okay? Nobody. All right? Let, let's not forget Nick Mullins is tied. Nick Mullins right now is sitting in the history books of football, tied with Joe Montana as the most touchdowns ever thrown throughout the first four games of a player's career. Now, I know the game has changed a lot, which has allowed quarterbacks freedom to be able to put up points. But Nick Mullins? Nick Mullins is in the same breath as Joe Montana? I really do think Kyle thinks he can do it with anybody. And if that's the case... He's not going to spend that number three pick on a quarterback. He's not going to pay that kind of price for a quarterback. He's going to draft a monster at tight end. He's going to change offenses for the next decade. Him and Bill Belichick are about to change the way we see offensive football for the next decade. And it's going to take teams a couple of years to to play catch up to that. I believe that. I think that's going to happen. So I'm telling you. Prepare yourselves now. April 29th, I think that's when the draft starts. April 29th, April 28th, April something. It's coming up in Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. Pick number three, 49ers on the board. They're on the board right now because we know pick number one and we know pick number two. The 49ers are on the clock. And I think the answer is going to be Kyle Pitts. And I think people are going to lose their minds. I think everybody's going to be caught off guard, and I think it's going to be so exciting. I really do. I do not think he spent two first-round draft picks to move up to pick Mac Jones. I just I can't, I can't see a world in which he did that. I just don't. I think he thinks he can make anybody a great quarterback. I really believe that. Anyway, I might be wrong, been wrong before. I, I go out on long shots. Long shots rarely come in, but when they come in, it's so much fun. It's the most fun you can have making predictions and making picks. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me. I appreciate you joining us. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, download the podcast, share it out with your friends. Leave us a five-star review if you're not on Apple. If you're on Apple, leave the review. Thank you so much. Um, it, it really means a lot to Gary and I. We've been doing this for, God, I don't I don't know if we're on year five, year six. What? 
I've gotten old, and, and anything past two years ago might as well have been a decade ago. But I'm having fun. This is the most fun I've ever had doing the podcast. Some of you guys interact with me all the time on Twitter through DMs and stuff. It, it means a lot. It, it really does. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to ask about your family. I, I'm going to see what you're into. I, I, I appreciate you all. I really, really do. Uh, we have so much fun with this. And uh, we're just guys that just want to talk sports and hang out. So I, I, I really want to just thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm going to get out of here. Enjoy it. Hopefully we'll uh, see you uh, Wednesday afternoon for the evening show. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter, at GaryWCE, at ChrisBGiannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com, or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.